Welcome to the ultimate beginner's guide for Naraka Bladepoint. It's not only going to teach you how to get better at the game, but it's going to teach you how to get better at getting better at the game, if that makes sense. I'm going to explain all the essential fundamentals over the course of this video, and by the end, you should have a solid understanding of what you need to learn and how to go about mastering it. The video is targeted at beginners, so naturally the point of the video is to help you transition out of that beginner stage and become intermediate or even advanced. There are a ton of things to go through, so let's break it down. There are two main umbrella categories in Naraka, combat and movement. In most games, the combat side is way more important, but that is not the case here, where someone with good movement and poor combat can often beat someone with good combat and poor movement. I'll get into why that is a bit later in the video. Under these umbrellas, we have some important categories. For combat, there's neutral, combos, and game knowledge, and for movement, there's general movement tech, scale rushing, and grappling. If you find yourself getting endlessly staggered by grapples and such while trying to run away, this section will help a ton. Before I get into each of these categories, I'm going to make some sweeping recommendations for anyone trying to learn Naraka in 2024. The first one is to pick a character with a combo breaking ability. If you're new to the game, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes, and as fun as certain non-combo breaking abilities can be, you're going to want that bailout button press. Just make sure the ability you have selected has the note of can be used under attack. Next, check your settings. If you're on PC, then I recommend nuking your graphical settings so they look something like this. It's a competitive PvP game, so it's frames over appearance all day long. If you're on console, you will be at a bit of a disadvantage with lower frame rate and some input delay, but you can still become absolutely amazing at the game, and in my opinion, gameplay experience is far more often the deciding factor for who wins a fight. No matter what platform you're on though, you'll want to turn off background music so you can properly hear footsteps and stuff. Next, within gameplay settings, if you're on console or playing through the Xbox app on PC, scroll down to this setting and turn it off. Turning it off reduces the amount of bots in your games, and actually allows you to improve while fighting real players. Last few things, make sure melee aim assist is on, counter composite is off, you know what, just make sure your settings look like this, especially ceiling interaction. Last page of settings, this is what I recommend. Pickup limits are great, so you can just spam pickup on loot without worrying about filling up your whole inventory with 20 repair kits or something. Just remember you can always override the limits by opening your inventory and manually sorting stuff. With some of the more general stuff out of the way, time to get into the first big umbrella category, combat. The first element of combat is neutral. Having good neutral means being able to land the first staggering attack in an exchange. The battle to win neutral begins as soon as you engage with someone, and it ends the moment you get that stagger. Winning neutral allows you to initiate some sort of combo, anywhere from the basic two-hit chain to more complex combos that I'll go over later. Depending on a whole bunch of different factors, a fight can end in one instance of winning neutral, or literal dozens of instances. For example, if you have a combo breaker, there's no way you can die to one loss of neutral, since you can escape whatever combo the opponent might try to follow up with. Then it depends on what sort of rarities of armor and weapons you have, since obviously if you're playing a gray weapon into purple armor, it's going to take a bit longer to kill. After that, it comes down to movement. If someone has the capability to evade you after losing neutral and get a way to heal up, it can turn into a battle of attrition, but we'll get more into that in the movement section. You have a few important tools to help you win neutral, with one of the easiest ones being parry bait. Simply charge a focus attack, cancel it with a hold dodge, and attack directly out of it. Make sure you use a hold dodge instead of a tap dodge in this case, since your attack will come out much faster. Your ability to win neutral this way relies on being able to get into your opponent's head and predict what they're going to do. You can feint a few focus attacks at a safe distance to feel things out and see if they tend to go for parries, which is a technique known as hold checking. In general though, going for this parry bait approach is much safer than releasing the focus attack and risking getting punished for it. Some people are really parry happy and you can just endlessly win neutral by refusing to release a focus attack. Another really useful tool is focus armoring, or half charging through attacks. Charging an attack allows you to avoid stagger from basic attacks, and for this to be possible, you do not need to be in the full blue focus state, hence the term half charge. This is what I'm actually talking about. When your opponent goes for a basic attack, you charge to armor through it, and release before the blue flash so you're able to stagger them. 
People will often go for a light attack as soon as they get in range of landing one, which you can anticipate with a half charge and completely reverse the aggression. Take advantage of spacing and try to bait out parries or basic attacks. Even if you don't react in time to punish a basic attack and win neutral, being in that charge state still prevents you from losing neutral. So it's a really good habit to get into, while single tapping light attacks isn't usually a great idea. Outside of parry baiting and half charging, we have tech chasing. I actually really don't like this term since I feel like it can be pretty confusing. Basically what it means is catching an opponent's dodge, so that's what I'm going to call it, dodge catching. Half charging actually plays an essential role in this too, since it allows you to delay an attack long enough to catch someone at the end of their dodge outside of the iframes. You want to go for a dodge catch whenever the opponent has been knocked down or is in any other state where they'll have to dodge to avoid more damage. Depending on the situation, you can go for a hold dodge into a basic attack, or a half charge, or a mix of both. It's hard to say what you'll want to do in every scenario, so it's something you'll have to get used to over time. Especially on wake ups though, be very aware of the recovery roll, and try to catch them at the very end of it. Alright, that covers basic attacks for the most part, but there's a lot to learning neutral, and your own parries and focus attacks are part of it. Just like how you should be trying to bait your opponents into parrying, they'll be trying to do that to you too, meaning that going for a parry can be pretty risky. It goes back to that prediction and mind games thing if you want to go for parries, although there are some attacks that can be parried on reaction, such as dagger soul break. It can be a good idea to go for dodges rather than parries at the beginning of a fight, and if you notice they tend to release, then you can more safely parry. The same sort of thing applies to releasing focus attacks, where if you've fainted a lot of attacks and you haven't seen them parry, it's going to be less risky to release. Sometimes after extended fights, I realize that someone literally never parries, so I just spam back to back focus attacks to punish them for the bad habit. An alternative to the first parry bait strategy that I mentioned is to overhold your focus rather than dodge out of it. Many people will go for a parry at the first blue flash, which means you can simply release slightly later and punish an early parry. If you're on the receiving end of this and someone overholds on you, make sure you attempt to immediately dodge away after your whiffed parry, since you might be able to escape it if they overhold for a little too long. The last thing to understand about focus attacks is that there are safe times to go for them where you can't be parried. Certain actions lock you into an animation where you won't be able to parry, such as uppercuts, plunging attacks, and recoveries after whiffing an attack. You can take advantage of this sort of animation lock to get easy half charge staggers too. The last thing I want to touch on is tap dodge versus hold dodge. The tap dodge has more iframes, longer distance, but longer recovery time, while hold dodge has the benefit of allowing you to directly enter sprint and attack much more quickly out of it. Tap dodge should be used defensively, like if you're trying to distance yourself from a focus attack, or dodge certain character abilities like Justina Freeze, Akos Pounce, Hadi Plume Blade, etc. Hold dodge can be used much more aggressively, where you can even dodge a focus attack and have time to punish the whiff. It's also extremely useful for movement, which of course I'll go over later in the movement section. Before we move on to the next section, there's one more big subject to talk about, and that's ranged weapons. I'm including this in this section despite the fact that you can't exactly win neutral with a ranged weapon, but it's still really important to your neutral game. I mentioned hold checking earlier, which is a really good tactic to consistently use, but plenty of players are way too comfortable just infinitely hold checking you from a safe distance, and you can punish that with a ranged weapon. Doing this really helps keep the pressure on the opponent and forces them to make some real plays. Good players will always be looking for opportunities to get some damage in before the real battle for neutral begins, so keep an eye out for those easy hold check shots. It can be pretty risky to take shots up close, since you won't be able to armor an attack or parry if you have your ranged weapon out as someone attacks you, but you can actually use this to your advantage too. If you take a shot at someone who's hold checking, chances are they'll want to release since they see you have a ranged weapon out. But if you animation cancel with either a dodge, jump, or crouch, you can quickly swap back to your melee weapon and parry. Range weapons are also extremely useful for finishing off someone who's trying to run away, and that's pretty much reason enough to always have one on you. In addition, there's a ton of potential for combo extension with ranged weapons, with the bow even offering a small stagger with its headshot. Definitely integrate ranged into your gameplay if you haven't yet. That's basically it for learning neutral. It sounds like a ton to think about, but if you try to focus on one thing at a time, it shouldn't take you all that long to incorporate all of it. Just to recap, these are your strategies to win neutral. Parry baiting with basic attack punish, parry baiting with overhold focus attack punish, 
going for your own parries and overheld focus attacks, half charge armoring through an opponent's basic attack, and dodge catching. The absolute best way to practice your neutral is to play custom matches, specifically 3-ban, which means that ultimates, abilities, and ranged weapons are not allowed. This lets you totally focus on learning neutral, so pick something like parry baiting to work on first, and add in more aspects to your gameplay as you get more comfortable. Moving on to combat part 2, combos. Combos are specific attack chains that are not possible to dodge out of, and they're extremely important to be able to take full advantage of winning neutral. The higher damage combos that you're capable of doing, the fewer times you'll have to win neutral to get a kill. Each weapon has its own unique properties, so it does take a while to become confident with all the best combos for each of them, but the fundamentals carry over, so new combos will become easier to learn as you progress. With the exception of short-handled weapons and heavy swords, all weapons are able to combo into an uppercut out of a basic attack. For most weapons, the uppercut is only guaranteed from a horizontal attack, with the exception of longsword, which requires a vertical attack for the following uppercut to be undodgeable. If you stagger the opponent with an attack that won't guarantee you the uppercut, just go for the barebones 1-2-3 combo, but instead of releasing that third attack, hold it so you can then dodge out of it and attempt to punish a parry with an attack that can initiate a combo. That dips back into the neutral section a bit, but it's a necessary bit of advice. Alright, so you've won neutral with an attack that combos into an uppercut, what now? There are hundreds of potential combos you can go for, anywhere from extremely easy to insanely difficult, and I've been sort of indecisive about what exactly I want to recommend. The sort of extremely easy combo I'm talking about is something like this with the longsword, which is vertical, uppercut, aerial horizontal, vertical. This is a combo that should only take you a couple of minutes to get down, even if you're brand new to the game, and it is still much more damaging than going for the basic 1-2 combo. However, since this guide is more about how to graduate to the intermediate or advanced stage, I want you to practice some more advanced combos. I actually made a whole video on this about a month ago, where I explained how to perform the bread and butter combos for each weapon. The combos I go over in that video can take you all the way from gold to unrivaled Asura, so I really do think it's worth getting them down, and simply practicing these combos will help you get a feel for the timing and input speed that Naraka requires. I'm actually going to copy and paste some of my combos video right into this one, since I don't really think I can explain each of them any better than my past self did. Before that though, I just want to say that it's okay if you find yourself messing them up a bunch at the start. Even if you've just learned a new combo and you're able to do it consistently in the training arena, being able to instantly pull it out of your toolkit once you win neutral in a real game is also going to take some practice. Again, that's why playing custom matches is such a good way to learn, because you get back-to-back -back opportunities to work on neutral and combos. Rotating your practice is a good idea, and by that I mean start in free training, then play some customs, then try a real match, and repeat, working on whatever got you killed in the real match. Okay, now I'll switch over to the actual combo guide, which of course you can skip if you've already seen my specific video on it. All the combos I put together for this video are meant to be totally attainable for the average player, and even if these combos are the only ones you know, you won't be held back in ranked mode. These are the bread and butter combos that I recommend using for each weapon, starting with the longsword. Before we go through all the other weapons, I'll explain the very important mechanic we just saw that will probably take a good few tries if you've never done it before, which is the grapple bump. Grapple combos are basically essential to have in your toolkit, so here are some key things to know to make them easier. What makes these combos possible is the fact that your uppercut animation can be cancelled with a grapple, and in order to have enough time to land a focus attack after the grapple bump, you need to make sure that you're firing your grapple the moment after the uppercut hits. Too early will result in no uppercut at all, and too late will let the opponent dodge away. Your aim matters, so you want to fire your grapple approximately at the far edge of this white circle for a proper grapple bump. Also, you don't need to aim this grapple last second, you can start setting up your aim as early as you want before the uppercut. This isn't always necessary, but you want to be holding left or right as the grapple bump hits. You can start holding it as early as you want in a combo, but I usually do it around when I'm firing the grapple. This is because if you've touched any other movement keys during your combo, you'll roll out of the grapple bump, and holding left or right will override that. One quick run through all in order, uppercut, grapple near the outside of the circle, start holding left or right, grapple bump hits, start charging vertical. Okay, now let's actually take a look back at the longsword combo. 
The combo notation is laid out in the description if you're unsure of what these abbreviations mean, but I'll also be saying them out loud since that'll probably help at least a few of you. For the bread and butter longsword combo, the combo chain is vertical, hold dodge, vertical, crouch vertical, grapple, focus vertical. For katana, it's horizontal, hold dodge, horizontal, crouch vertical, grapple, focus vertical. For the hang sword, it's actually the exact same thing as katana. For dual blades, it's horizontal, uppercut, grapple, focus vertical, hold dodge, vertical. You can add another horizontal in with the hold dodge just like with katana and hang sword, but in this case it's only soft true, meaning that it can be broken out of with certain non-combo breaker abilities, so just use it carefully. For dual halberds, it's horizontal, uppercut, grapple, focus vertical. Same goes for the extra horizontal at the start. When in doubt, just don't use it. For nunchucks, it's horizontal, hold dodge, horizontal, crouch vertical, aerial horizontal, so just tap horizontal right after the uppercut, then after you hit the ground, vertical, vertical. Spear and staff combos function similarly, and I'll actually be giving two here that can be used with either weapon. The first is horizontal, uppercut, aerial horizontal, then jump horizontal after you hit the ground. You can use this one if you're on uneven terrain, and it works the vast majority of the time. If you're on flat ground though, you should be going for this combo, which is horizontal, uppercut, start holding forwards near the end of your uppercut, wait till you hit the ground, horizontal, vertical, crouch horizontal, horizontal. For the remaining weapons, there aren't many complex uppercut combos since they don't have any basic attacks that confirm into an uppercut, but I'll give you some useful attack chains and tips on how to use the weapons. For dagger and fan, you have a basic 3 hit chain of horizontal, crouch horizontal, vertical, or vertical, crouch horizontal, vertical. Dagger's horizontal focus attack happens to be an uppercut, so if you do land one of those, you want to follow it up with a hold dodge, horizontal, horizontal. Fan has access to an uppercut through its own soul break attack, so if you happen to land that wind rush, you can go straight into an uppercut, grapple, focus vertical, jump vertical. Although you do need to be close enough to your opponent when the wind attack hits for this to work. For greatsword and pole sword, there's no easy access to uppercut, but if you happen to land one randomly, you can hold dodge out of the uppercut, horizontal, vertical. For greatsword, you'll want to dodge to the side, and for pole sword, backwards. Playing with PS or GS usually doesn't revolve around going for combos at all though. You'll mostly just want to be mind gaming your opponent with hold checks, baiting them into parries, and sneaking in random bits of damage. That's all the weapons. Obviously I didn't go over every useful combo in the game, but if you're a relatively new player, and just want to make sure you have at least something up your sleeve for every weapon, you came to the right place. That's it for the combo section. I promise you're capable of these with some practice. Let's move on. Now for the game knowledge section. It's a pretty vague category, but the fact is that there are a lot of specific interactions to know with character abilities, soul jades, and tech. I wish I could give a comprehensive list of everything you could possibly need to be aware of, but that would make this video an hour long, and a whole lot of it wouldn't be that important to a new player anyways, so I'll just go over some basic game knowledge that's pretty essential. First, you need to understand the types of focus attacks, blue, purple, and gold. Blue focus can be parried, while purple and gold focus cannot. 
When it comes to purple focus, your only options are to dodge or clank, meaning throw your own focus attack against it. For gold focus, neither clanking or parrying is an option, so your only option is to dodge. It's easy to tell what kind of focus you're dealing with, just pay attention to the aura around the opponent's weapon. This next bit refers back to the combos section, where you might have heard me use the term soft true. A soft true combo can be broken out of with a soft true combo breaker, even though it doesn't have the notation that says it can be used while under attack. It's very important to be aware of which characters have access to soft true combo breakers, so you know what you can and can't do against them. Like I said in the combos section though, when in doubt, just assume that they do have it. Since this is the one section where I won't be trying to be totally comprehensive, I'm gonna link a whole bunch of videos down below that go over various hero interactions, soul jades, and more. So if after this video you decide you want to dive even deeper, you can boost your random bits of game knowledge as much as you like and become a godly Naraka player. What I will say about soul jades is that you generally want to be at the maximum melee damage reduction of 24%, so always be keeping an eye on these stats when you open up your inventory and make sure you're not a walking piece of glass. That wraps up the combat section, but there will be plenty of crossover as I move on. Finally back to our big umbrella, heading into the movement section and starting with general movement tech. These techniques are used constantly, whether you're chasing a player, running away, or just trying to quickly traverse the map. If you're trying to run away from a player just by sprinting, they'll be able to catch up to you super quickly, even without grapples. Slide hopping and focus dashing are two things that players do all the time to move fast. Slide hopping alone is slightly faster than the normal sprint, but it's more so used when you're out of stamina and unable to continue focus dashing. A focus dash is really simple. All you have to do is start charging a focus attack and hold dodge out of it, then repeat. Not only does doing this give you bursts of speed, but any time during the focus charge, you're immune to basic attack and grapple stagger, which is absolutely vital to be able to successfully escape a bad situation. If all you're doing is sprinting, it will be basically impossible to run away from a decent player since you're constantly susceptible to grapple staggers. Although, focus dashing is still not the most optimal way to escape someone since there's another method that's not only faster, but gives you more armor frames to ignore grapple stagger. I guess I'll call it dodge attacking, which is pretty self-explanatory, as in the inputs are attack, hold dodge, repeat. With most weapons you'll want to use a vertical attack for this, besides longsword, which is horizontal. The heavy swords are exceptions as usual, where you'll actually want to opt for slide hop horizontal into hold dodge, or just the normal focus dashing, but usually a mix of both. With staff and spear you also have the option to go for repeated sliding uppercuts, which provides a long window of grapple stagger immunity, so that can be integrated as well. All these bits of movement tech have their place depending on the terrain, so definitely experiment with your options as you practice your movement. One last thing for this section. You'll often see people spamming crouch while they're healing, and there's two reasons for that. One, it allows you to move slightly faster, and two, it makes you harder to hit with a ranged weapon. You should definitely get into the habit of doing this if you're not already. Moving on to scale rushing, it's performed by clinging to the side of something, aiming where you want to go, and pressing horizontal attack. This is something that's very important at times, and not useful at all in others. It totally depends on the environment. If you're battling it out in an open field, and there's not really anything to scale rush off of, then of course you're not going to be able to get much use out of them. But if you're fighting in an area like Celestra or Matab, where there's tons of material to scale rush off of, being good at it becomes extremely useful. If you have really good movement and scale rush capabilities, you can almost feel invincible in these more dense parts of the map. Scale rushing through a window, onto another wall, and over a roof can be very difficult to track and will allow you a window to heal up before re-engaging. One of the best things you can do to up your scale rush game is dodge out of them. The timing with each weapon is slightly different, and to get the hang of it you'll just have to experiment, but the cue to dodge is roughly near the end of your attack animation, and using the sound of the slash can be really helpful to get used to the timing. On the bright side, it's really easy to practice this at a high frequency. Once you have this down, you should work towards what's called a double dash, which begins with the first dash of course, but it's directly chained into a charge attack, which can then be chained into another dodge. All the inputs for this are pretty tight, being hold dodge, charge vertical, hold dodge. Again you should practice this piecemeal, first get the initial dodge consistent, then add the charge, then the final dodge. Although not a full replacement, an alternative to double dash is using an attack instead of a focus dash. Just like with general movement tech, you'll want to half charge this attack, 
and it allows you to manipulate your movement in a similar way to focus dashing. This is essential to integrate into your scale rushing because it's what allows you to reorient in the air, which you'll need if you want to do something like scale rush out of a building and dash back onto the rooftop or just speedily round a corner. Mastering the timing of this will make chaining scale rushes much easier, where you can instead jump out of your scale rush or other movement to quickly cling back onto the surface and scale rush again. There are a few more things you need to understand about scale rushing to be able to use them optimally. The first one is that you're limited by your camera angle when looking up. So let's say you're trying to climb a vertical face like this. You don't want to just aim directly up the face of the wall, since you'll be stuck in place more often than not. Instead, you want to aim to the side, or even slightly behind you, since it frees up your scale rush and ensures you go where you want to. Certain surfaces actually grant different properties to your scale rush. Trees, for example, will adjust it to a short vertical scale rush unless you charge it to the blue state. So if you're trying to climb a tree quickly, the best way to do it is by inputting scale rush, jump, scale rush, repeat. The very tops of trees and certain other outcroppings and objects can be scale rushed off of even if you're not clinging to the side of anything. You can recognize this when you're in this crouch state right here. Scale rushes aren't just for running away though, they can be incredibly useful for taking someone off guard and initiating a combo, since landing a scale rush will allow you to chain into an uppercut. Scale rushes can be charged to blue focus to put extra pressure on the opponent, but use this carefully as it can often be parried. I'll talk about scale rushes a little bit more in this next section, but for now, we're moving on to grapples. There is a whole lot more to grappling than just aiming and firing. There are no limitations on what you can grapple. If it's got a collision, you can grapple it, which gives you a ton of freedom. The first thing you learn about grappling is how to increase the range that you're launched with an attack. It's really simple. All you have to do is tap horizontal attack right before you reach the point that you grappled. Not only is it good for the extra distance, but you're immune to enemy grapple stagger while in this attack. If you're running away from someone and you're worried about getting grappled early, you can activate this attack earlier as well to avoid the stagger. Speaking of enemy grapples though, let's dive a little deeper into that. I debated putting this in the text section, but since it's directly related to grapples, I think it works here. When you're down on health and trying to escape for a reset, you can't just turn around and grapple away since you'll be very easily caught by either the enemy's grapple or just a basic attack if you're in range. Attempting to grapple away from someone should almost never be done when you're within line of sight of that player. You can sometimes break that rule by tap dodging away, then double jumping and grappling, but this only works if the opponent isn't ready for it and makes a mistake like animation locking themselves in a basic attack before they can grapple or uppercut you in time. Although if you're desperate and there's hardly any cover around, it can be worth going for. The ideal way to go about disengaging starts by using your focus dashing and dodge attacking to make some space and keeping an eye out for useful scale rushes with the goal of breaking line of sight. Once you've successfully distanced yourself from an opponent, they'll likely be looking to grapple you. As we know, you can't be staggered by a grapple if you're charging or in the middle of an attack, so keep your ears open and listen for the grapple to be fired so you can armor it. Depending on how far away you are, it might be difficult to react to, so prediction can be really important too. Just pay attention to recovery times and whether or not you're in line of sight, and you can pretty reliably be aware of the moments when the opponent is likely to go for a grapple. Try not to waste your stamina in between grapple attempts, and just keep making your way towards a building, or just anything at all to kite the enemy around. Even if it seems like you won't be able to make it to a possible reset point, stalling like this gives your abilities some time to refresh, which could win you the fight if you do have to re-engage. If you do get grapple staggered though, just remember that a grapple attack is not guaranteed from a certain distance away, so if you're far enough, you should go for a tap dodge through the grapple attack, then it's back to basics. Alternatively, if you want to reverse the aggression a bit, you can opt for charging an attack instead of tap dodging, and if they commit to the grapple attack, you have a window to release your focus. One last tip for grapple movement is that after your grapple attack, you can hold dodge while mid-air, just like how you can with scale rush, and then make use of a double dash or dodge attack to make your movement more unpredictable and potentially armor through a grapple stagger. Shifting back to where you're the one chasing and grappling, here's some important things to know. First, if you land a grapple attack, you have the option to chain directly into a 1-2 basic attack combo, so keep that in mind as a punish. Lastly, in a situation where you've grappled the opponent and they've had time to start charging an attack before you reach them, you can choose to bail out of your grapple with a jump and resume chasing, or risk it by going for a parry, or predicting that they won't release and just going for the grapple attack. 
All that is why the grapple tool has a whole lot more to it than just point and click. If you run out of grapple spools, you should make it your first priority to get more, because you're kind of just dead in the water otherwise. That essentially wraps up the movement section. If you master all these aspects, you'll have consistently higher placement across all your games, and be able to beat out people that might have substantially better combat skills than you do. Once again, Naraka is a movement game as much as it is a fighting game, and if someone can't catch you and finish the kill, you'll just be able to reset over and over until you're able to pull off the combos or parries that you were missing before. And with that, it looks like I've just about covered everything that I wanted to. I really hope you enjoyed the video, and if you feel more confident about the transition out of that beginner stage, that's all I can ask for. I know it was a bit of a knowledge dump, and it might feel a little overwhelming, but like I said for some of the subtopics, take it step by step. You don't have to master combat and movement all at once, just pick a few things you want to focus on first, and move on to other stuff once you feel comfortable. Naraka is an absolute blast once you get the hang of the fundamentals. Good luck with it, and I'll see you next time.